There will be no glory in your sacrifice. I will erase even the memory of Sparta from the histories. The world will never know you existed at all. The world will know that free men stood against a tyrant, that few stood against many. And before this battle was over, that even a god king can bleed. And it's begun. It's the 22nd of January, 2017. Episode 4. Episode 4. It's coming along. It is. Yep. It's happening. We're doing, get... we're doing it now, weekly. Yeah. Oh, the editing is, is something else, though. <laughs> it's happening, guys. This, it's happening, The folks. sound editing we're doing the show it. together in post-production is... Uh, it's not. It doesn't take too long. Once you're building macros and stuff like that, it doesn't take all that long. It takes about 45 minutes to do. But yeah. the uploading of it... Because I like to put the archive.org address on the YouTube thing... So you can yeah. go and get the running order if you want to. You have to wait for the archive.org to upload it. And then you have to wait for YouTube to upload it and process it. It's mm-hmm. quite a thing. Anyway. Yeah, unfortunately. Mm. But hey-ho. Hey-ho, into the news. Who wants to go with the first news story? I'll start. Okay, man. Uh, from UFOs to its psychic Stargate tests, the CIA dumped 13 million declassified pages online. Now, this one's from um, <clears throat> this is a Wired article. Uh, the CIA dumped 13 million pages of declassified documents online to make them easy to find, and you can find them all. They're, they're available for everyone to look at. Mm. Uh, it was a result of a long running long running push for freedom of, by freedom of information activists demanding the release of documentation that is no longer classified. The collection should make fascinating reading with scientific research, policy files, senior correspondence, and yes, UFO sightings and psychic experiments conducted under the Stargate program, ranging from the 1940s up to the 1990s. <clears throat> the BBC has pulled out report- reports made in the 1970s into Uri Geller's apparent psychic abilities, for example. Since 2000, the CIA has been operating a searchable database, known as Crest, from the National Archives in Maryland. It was populated with the records that were each manually reviewed by staff, who checked to see if they fell under the terms of the 25-year program, a policy implemented by former President Bill Clinton, who said documents should be made public if they were of historical value. Following that bulk drop and since, the CIA researchers have printed 1.1 million pages, However, it is necessary to physically go to the National Archives in the US to access the files. Now the agency has asserted on its site, the CIA recognised that such visits were inconvenient and presented an obstacle to many researchers. Therefore, in January 2016, the CIA has published the records of the Crest Collection online. What the CIA fails to mention on its website is that the battle non-profit Muck, Muckrock has been waging uh, to force the agency to make the whole database publicly available and soon. As a result of that freedom of information lawsuit, every file has been finally been made accessible. That's pretty damn cool. Yeah, I mean, so I'm, I might have to go and have a look at that. I haven't had time yet, but yeah, it'd be interesting if it's all sorted into wacky shit, UFOs, and and naughty stuff we were doing in Vietnam. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like really handily done, but yeah. So now you really can access it from the comfort of your own home, and that's a direct quote. <laughs> the last quote's fantastic. We've been working on this for a very long time, and this is the one thing, one of the things I wanted to make sure I got done before I left. Departing Director of Information Management at the CIA, Joseph Lambert, told BuzzFeed, now you can access it from the comfort of your own home. So it's like he's leaving. It's all like, made everything available. We look like idiots. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps you know. I mean, do 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 remember that um, Trump only very recently, like prior to becoming president, was calling the CIA um, was actually accusing the CIA of doing a lot of stuff. Hmm. So I'm wondering if this is kind of a little bit of a middle finger to Trump. 
Yeah, I'm wondering that too. It's sort of like, you know, so we, we, we best open everything up. I mean, it's from 25 years ago. Oh, we're, oh, we're, we're shits, are we? We're terrible people, are we? How about all this? You can explain all this. See you later. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh. yeah, so definitely worth going to have a look while it's there. Yeah, because it might disappear soon. So if, if you want that, it's in the yeah, running order, which is always uploaded to the archive.org, the link to which you'll find on the YouTube thing probably sometime tomorrow night. So if you want to just click on it. But you can also go to Wired if you're impatient in the meantime. <laughs> and that uh, Digital Whiskey is joining us in, in the text part of Mumble. Um, so, uh, da -da -da -da. it's just the... Lol, that was like the ultimate later bitches. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I should I should probably fire up the IRC as well, see if anybody's in there. So if you're in the IRC, okay. let people know that we're now recording if they want to join us in um, the Mumble server. Because that'd be cool. It's kind of weird having an audience, but it is cool. It's... And this is the yeah, Mumble really server is essentially Kevin helping us out um, by giving us access to the Mumble server, which has also been used by Rant, I think. Yeah. So I'm that's really pretty cool. I, I really want to know whether it's something that a Raspberry Pi could do, whether you could use it to run a, a web server and a Mumble server and just leave the thing plugged in. Maybe. So they might Maybe. have to build that. Wouldn't that be a good thing to build into a Rangers distro? That would be very cool. Raspberry Pi Rangers distro. <laughs> sort of like, you know, with all sorts of naughty shit on it so you can make your own media. Anyway, so moving on. Um, so my story next. So China says it will finish their super, super computer prototype this year. So when exascale computers become a reality, they will be able to take complete a quintillion calculations per second and tackle incredibly complex mathematical and medical modelling tasks. According to Chinese officials, one of the first glimpses of exascale technology may arrive this year. The country is planning on developing a prototype supercomputer that will be ready before any other competitors. And according to state media, developer Zhang Ting, sponsor of this, this uh, week's uh, and episode, soft drinks. <laughs> of Chinese, China's National Supercomputer Center, said the prototype would be ready before 2017 is out. A complete computing system of the exascale uh, supercomputer and its applications can only be expected in 2020 and it will be 200 times more powerful than the country's first petaflop computer the Chane one recognized as the world's fastest in 2010 the Xinhua, Xinhua, Xinhua news agency reported Zhang is saying at present it's not clear how advanced the 2017 prototype would be Wired has contacted China's National Computer Sim Sen National Supercomputer Center for clarification, and it will be up to update this story when a response is received. And if successful, the creation of an exascale computer by China would cement its place as one of the leading computer manufacturers in the world. So it's no secret that the country has been creating an exascale computer. In October 2016, scientists at the Supercomputer Center said they had started developing one. They claimed an early version might be ready as soon as early 2018. The latest announcement implies work has progressed faster than expected. And China isn't the only country working on an exascale computer, though. In the U.S. Department of Energy, is, in the U.S., the Department of Energy is running the Exascale Computing Project, which is looking to increase the petascale level of computers that exist right now. The project awarded 39.8 million dollars of grants to partners developing the technology necessary to build one by 2023. Oh, so that's what? How many million, billion, trillion? What's a what's a what's a million trillion? <coughs> wow, well, a lot. At a lot it's of calculations per second, <laughs> exascale yeah. computers will be able. To, well, it's quintillion, isn't it? It's got one, two, mm -hmm. three, four, five. Well, that's a thousand quintillion because a quintillion is five sets of zeros, and there's six yeah. sets here. So uh, a whole jimmy whack, as Sean Kennedy might say of calculations per second exascale computers will also be able to quickly anal anal analyze the massive volumes of data and more realistic si more realistically simple let's try again simulate the complex processes and relationships behind many of the fundamental forces of the universe the u.s government says on its website yeah and it'll probably be also able to filter email and in, you know break encryption a lot faster as well 
Mm-hmm. So at the moment, China is leading the way to, by owning the most powerful supercomputer in the world, the Sunway Chilu Light, which is a processing speed of 93 petaflops. At its peak, the computer can perform 93,000 trillion calculations per second. In total, one, 167 of the most powerful 500 computers in the world reside in China. And the US is developing a number of supercomputers that will be capable of beating the Sunway Cholite, a 200 petaflop machine called Summit, is being developed at Oak Ridge National Lab and is due to arrive in 2018. Japan is also heavily investing in supercomputing technology and has said it will spend 19.5 billion yen, or 139 million pounds, on a 130 petaflop computer. So, yeah. See, this is interesting because supercomputers have been like out of the news for a long time. Like, you, you mentioned a supercomputer, most people, they'll think of the Cray. Yeah. And no one's really been talking about that for a long time, and <laughs> for a while we've been talking about distributed computing, well, it, replacing uh, it, supercomputers. Yeah, it's been up there with the, let's talk about the AI, and, you know, mm. the thinking behind it, but, you know, what if but it seems an AI gets into one again. of these things? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you... You know, I mean, if if it had any kind of artificial, you know, like the Google computer generating its own language to make translation more intelligent, you know, what, you know, this is, I mean, the AI is the program, the program with those sort of those sorts of resources and some sort of network connection is, you know, would be pretty interesting. Yeah. So, yeah. But it's been interesting that sort of like, you know, obviously they've been developing this technology at the same time as they're developing distributed computing and smart thinking on the part of computers. I mean, at what point do humans hand over control of an economy to something smart and powerful like that? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Stroke of non-existent beard. Yes. Do you want to read out on your Yeah, I can do if you want. Okay. I think the next article is um, Theresa May under pressure over Trident missile test. Um, uh, The media caption said that the Prime Minister declined four times to answer questions about when she had been aware of the misfire. Uh, Theresa May is coming under pressure to say whether she knew about a reported misfire in the UK's nuclear weapons systems before a crucial Commons vote. Sunday Times says the missile veered off course during a test in June last year, weeks before the Commons voted to spend another £40 billion renewing Trident. Questioned by Andrew Marr, the Prime Minister refused to say four times if she had known about the test ahead of the vote. Uh, the SNP's Nicola Sturgeon called for a full disclosure of what had happened. According to the Sunday Times, an unarmed Trident Type 2 D5 missile veered off in the wrong direction towards the USA. Maybe we could have got a Trump there instead. But instead of <laughs> towards Africa, where it was launched from a British submarine off the coast of Florida. Makes turning page noises. You don't have to read the whole story. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so in July, days after, blah, blah, the MPs voted overwhelmingly in favour for replacing Trident. I wonder whether, if they'd have known if about have known the misfire, do you think they would have 180 um, degrees in the wrong direction. overwhelmingly voted? I don't think so. Can you imagine that phone call? No. Because the Americans watch the whole planet for, for launches of missiles. <laughs> and these things go up very, so, very high. So imagine the phone call. Um, we've just fired a missile at you, <laughs> completely by mistake. Honest, by mistake, honest. We promise it doesn't have a nuclear warhead. We're playing old James Bond. We have four minutes to remove. We played some old James Bond films to find out what we should do in this scenario. Yeah. uh... Oh fuck. This is just yeah. I I almost guaranteed they wouldn't have renewed Trident if they'd known about this. Mm. There'd have been a an outcry. It'd have been. Oh my god! It just you—you you know that this was hidden yeah. <laughs> from everyone. You I know, just... you, everybody knows. May ha- did know. May knew that this happened. It's impossible that she didn't know because of, she had an iron grip on the Home Office when she was in charge of it. When she was the Home Secretary, she will have known about this. Purposely hid it from Parliament to get Trident renewed. 
Mm. I think it's funny because I just read down a bit further and the campaign for nuclear design at the C&D group described reports of a misfire as a very serious failure. I thought that's what they really wanted. They didn't want any nuclear weapons to go off in the first place. So, mm. so actually something that didn't work would be far better than something it did. Um, yeah, but it's like, you know, a statement issued by both Downing Street and the MOD said the capability and effectiveness of Trident was unquestionable. <laughs> crap. <laughs> Unquestionably crap. Well, I mean, there's all sorts of problems with Trident. I mean, one, we now know it doesn't go anything like in the right direction, which is a biggie. Mm -hmm. I'll admit that's a, that's a bit of a, a steering issue. But also, we, we can't launch um, the nuclear-tipped missiles without the American launch codes. So they're essentially no. American missiles, mm. That's handy, and that it? price of four hundred and forty billion is the lowball price to get it through Parliament. Mm. That's what it will cost to upgrade it, but they're not not the amount that it will cost to fix it and maintain it. And they there have been estimates of anywhere up to one hundred and twenty billion. Mm. You sure these weren't the missiles that um, Tony Blair was quoting when he was talking about this imminent danger from uh, from Iraq? Yeah. Well, it will look if like it's if been known that they Iraq worked when in that way. Sky, you really worry, in, really, yeah. really. So you just toss a dice and say, "I think we need it's to make going it look like way. Iraq can launch a yeah. nuclear weapon." Because basically, <laughs> our nuclear weapons may just turn the fuck around if we try and launch them and bomb us. So, yeah. Wow. It is expected that my Defence Secretary Michael Fallon will be called to the Commons to answer questions from MPs. I, don't, I think it's unnecessary. Theresa May would have definitely known about it. He's definitely yeah. going to be in the naughty corner now. So, <laughs> in the past, the MOD has realistic re issued a press release and a video of successful tests, but its silence on this occasion has raised questions as to whether any fault was deliberately kept quiet ahead of the key vote. Really? Yeah, that's a... We, we wonder? Mm. Oh, is that a possibility? I don't think it's just a possibility. I think it's just like, you know, an actual fact. Yeah. And even then, you know, the current um, generation of four submarines are ending their lives sometime in their working lives sometime in the late 2020. So we'll have to buy them, a bunch of them. And um, Vanguard was only refitted at a cost of £350 million in 2015. Yeah. So we spent £350 million on a refit. Um, of one submarine so there are four of them so that's 1.4 billion pounds mm. just to refit them they can't launch the they can't do the one thing they're supposed to do right because mm -hmm. the munitions are wrong I mean there was a there was a story a while back about uh, the British destroyer fleet having less firepower than it did in 1918. <laughs> because we haven't yeah. got any mi there are no missiles on the British missile destroyers mm. they've got a couple of uh, those they destroyed them all um, what do you call it um, Pelham miniguns mm. and that's it they haven't got any missiles on them at the moment so the British Navy yeah. is, is, a, is in its worst shape ever the Royal Navy um, so do you know what we've got three new nuclear subs mm. that are part of the astute, part of the astute programme Astute, ambush, and artful. Mm. There's seven in that are planned, but we're not going to have those, all of them, until 2024. Nice. So until then, the Vanguard parts have to still be running. I mean, do you remember the whole thing with the Nimrod aircraft? Yeah. Where we spent something like £250 million per aircraft for three of them, and they were late and over budget. I think the new plan is that they're going to just get the missiles on a frigate, take yeah. it to near to the coast, and then just catapult it. Well, at the time, to buy it, to just buy an AWACS, <laughs> just just an AWACS, an American one that can see everything in Europe, basically, if it's high enough, mm. was only mm -hmm. about £15 million. Pounds. So we could have just bought a shitload of AWACS off Boeing and fitted our yeah. own radar technology and shit, because the Americans won't give us that. Or nuclear launch codes. Um... So Do you yeah, remember they um, didn't want to give us um, what's it called either? They didn't want to give us those um, lightning twos, those new joint strike fighters. Oh yeah, and because uh, back there was there was a, a nasty rumor in the Falklands that you may well have heard from a mutual acquaintance that uh, there was a radar system that the Americans wouldn't let us have, but they'd sold to the Argentinians. And when we, when we took Mount Tumble down, there was one of these radar installations on it. So we immediately had access to all the radar technology that we'd been refused to have before. 
and the <laughs> Americans after the Falklands War asked if we might not be prepared to uh, give it back to the Argentinians. Mm. To which we said, no. <laughs> no, we have it now. No, we're not giving Reda back now. No. Spoils you... of war, I'm afraid. <laughs> we want more lemon pledge. No, send your Superman not home. But yeah, so... <laughs> and I mean things like the SA80 when we had Vickers making it we had to mm. give it to Heckler and Koch to actually fix it all yeah I mean now it's a good rifle then it was considered yeah. the worst rifle ever issued when we could have bought a whole bunch of AR-15s we could have gone to a Walmart nearly and bought enough AR-15s for the British Army mind you the yeah. reason they can't give us the codes is because of Doctor Strangelove earlier yeah if you give them the codes then you, you can't ride a nuclear weapon down yeah. to the ground waving your cowboy hat mm. screaming yee-haw unfortunately <laughs> oh that's mental oh. it really is so, and they tell us now what's what it's like six months ago at least that they yep. shot a nuclear weapon. That they shot a nuclear weapon in the general direction of Africa. I'd have been pissed off at that if I if I was in any of the countries in Africa. Yes, we've, we because you have no international presence to speak of. We decided that Africa would be a good continent to lob a nuclear weapon at, or a non-nuclear weapon. You know, so if it came down, it wasn't too much of a biggie. And then it went completely wrong, and uh, went towards the Americans. I'd love to know what the American Defence Secretary has got to say about that. <clears throat> yeah, there's nothing in there about that, is there? Yeah. I don't, I, I don't understand this this bit where it says there are three parts to the Trident system, submarines, missiles and warhead, warheads. And although though each component has years of use left, they cannot last indefinitely. I don't, I don't really see this whole... You know, we need to replace it periodically. We have something that goes at the speed of a rocket, which is jolly fast. You know, it's, it's it's a ballistic missile. It goes out of the atmosphere to come down. It's basically a space rocket with a bomb on the end. Yeah, maybe maybe it's just they keep charging as extra for the codes. But this is like renting a television. You know, well, you want a new attack, yeah. don't you? But I've already paid for a television ten times over by now. You know, I'm, I'm not saying these things should be... They're not going to be cheap, certainly. But do they need to be replaced? I mean, <clears throat> you want to, you know... I, you know, I think, you know, if you have a bullet, you know, if they keep getting bullets, you know, then this is a very a thing that can corrode real easy. It's got no user serviceable parts inside. But you've got bullets turning up from the 1960s that are being bought en masse, you know, like Russian, for the Americans that have got AK-47s. And they're buying, like, Cold War ammunition, and it's still serviceable, and it still fires. Surely, with a missile, all you've got to do is take the fuel out, make sure that the nuclear bit isn't going wrong in any way, and then put the fuel back mm -hmm. in, and then wait till the fuel goes off, and then take it out and replace the fuel. The launching mechanism, these things are built to last, and built to survive um, EMP. So, do they do they rust? Do, do nuclear weapons rust? In which case, submarines are not a good launch environment. Yeah. Or, you know, why do we need to replace them? Like the submarines. It's like, do they go underwater? Yes. Are they very stealthy? Yes, they're very stealthy. Do we need new ones, why? I don't... It's like, we need to update our ability. We need to kill more people. It's like, because the other guys can kill more. If there is a nuclear war, how many people we kill is kind of irrelevant at the point when missiles are incoming. In fact, back in the late 70s, Clive Sinclair suggested something called the nuclear tortoise, which wouldn't be submarine launched at all. It would be like a robot that would crawl across the landscape and then blow up when it got to its target. Three years yeah. later. Giving everybody plenty of time to decide that nuclear war was a bad idea. I mean, can't we just pretend? Can't we just put big wooden ones? Or like <laughs> dummy nuclear missiles, or just cruise missiles or shit. You know, cruise is, is a nuclear delivery capability. That works. We've got like, bloody hundreds of them. The Americans have got nuclear-tipped cruise missiles. Why don't we just like go with them? They're nice and easy. You just need a big tube and a, and a, and a, a little cord to pull at one end. <laughs> <laughs> like, like a cannon. But no, it's like, no, 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 Polaris is la so last year. We need Trident. Yeah. And now we need new Trident. 
We tried D2 or D5. We, we tried One biological. We tried plus. Yeah. Sponsored by Silit Bang. <laughs> Oof. <laughs> Kaboom! And the stain Ooh. from the stain on the on the on the landscape is gone forever. The stain on the landscape is glass. Yeah. And as we said, Digital Whiskey's chimed in with, and um, why have them in the first place? What is the point? There isn't anymore. Well, uh, mutually assured destruction was yeah. the reason. I'm using really, really, really big air quotes here. Yeah, mad. But, and you know, this is all to do with like um, game theory. Um, if you want to know why game theory is important and why they, why governments still talk on about game theory and they still want to have nuclear weapons. Um, it's worth watching an Adam Curtis documentary that I can't remember the name of, but he does go on and talk about about game theory. It's Do you either, remember which one it is? It's either it's not Century of the Self. It's the other one. Is it the, the Power of Nightmares? Oh, the, the Power of Nightmares. No, it's the Power of Nightmares. You got it. <coughs> uh, no, it might it might be the Trap actually. No, John it's, Nash. It's, yeah, I think it is the Trap actually. Yeah. John Nash is the guy that uh, Russell Crowe plays in A Beautiful Mind. Mm. And it's completely, yeah, it, it un- it's completely unlike him because everybody hated John Nash. Everybody that ever worked with him for him or anywhere near him couldn't stand him. And uh, Russell Crowe was just this big fuzzy person that was trying to make everything better. Which is, I watched A Beautiful Mind and they didn't mention all the terrible mind games that he came up with once. Mm-hmm. They really, really glossed over it. But yeah, Digital Whisk is right. What is the point? You're only going to know for four minutes whether your nuclear missiles are done. That's not enough time to fire, to, to write the angry email to the head office. Yeah. Let's just have wooden ones and spend the money on like childcare and shit. But yeah, now the track, if you want to know about game theory and why, why governments believe it's important to have nuclear deterrence, hmm. you've got to watch the trap by Adam, Adam Curtis yeah, that explains no, it all nobody flat out says um, we can't stop bad guys sending a nuclear weapon your way but we can make sure that we can kill every last one of everybody they've ever met if they do yeah you know that's it that's all they can do we will by by, <laughs> by Sigmar's moons by by Grabthar's hammer you will <laughs> be avenged <laughs> yeah that's pretty much what it is oh dear oh Oh, it's, I think it's your turn for the last news story. It is, yeah. On to the last one here. <clears throat> Trump team in fresh war of words with US media. Key thing is, in Donald Trump's administration, have become embroiled in a fresh war of words with the media. Uh, pro tip, war of words, uh, in this case, means propaganda. On Saturday, the president had condemned the media reporting a number of people attending his <laughs> inauguration. White House Chief of Staff... R- Run it, I think, is that's what it is. Reince Priebus, I say, said there was an obsession to delegitimize this president. We're not going to sit around and take it. But photos appeared to show more people had attended the inauguration. Do you see how carefully they said that? Photos appear yeah. to show that Trump is lying. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Priebus said on Fox News Sunday that the media from day one has been talking about delegitimizing this election. He said that Mr. Trump's presidency would fight such coverage tooth and nail every day. Uh, 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 question: um, Fight tooth and nail like the lawsuit that you said you would fight tooth and nail, and then settled out of court when you became president. Hmm. Is that the Trump University one? That is indeed the Trump University one, yeah. which he said he would never settle and he would make an example of. And oh, he's given them all the money they wanted. Yeah, you, you're really going to fight the the nail there, Trumpo. <laughs> no one came no, to no, Trump's party. <laughs> no one came to party. <laughs> That's like a kid's book. Is, but <laughs> but nobody came to Trump's party. Because Trump was a dick. Yeah. There were no official estimates. Um, Mr. Trump said during a visit to the CIA on Saturday that it looked like, it looked like half a million people, million and a half, sorry, but provided no evidence. He called reporters among the most dishonest human beings on Earth for saying it was far lower. His press secretary, Sean Spicer, 
outlined figures amounting to 7, 720,000 people in Washington's media. Uh, in Washington's media. Oh, that's a caption thing. That's my fault. I was putting this together yeah. quick. All right. Uh, let's see. He also said it was the largest audience ever with the witness and inauguration period, both in person and around the globe. <laughs> That's slippery, isn't it? Which, Most, there were probably a few million people watching it around the globe because they wanted to see how few people turned up. Yeah. Also wanted to see what Trump was actually saying, what terrible things he was going to say. Yeah. Um, many US outlets using photos of the National Mall showing the difference in numbers attending the 2009 inauguration and Mr. Trump's hit on Mr. Spicer's statements. Uh, the New York Times announced false claims again false claims uh, meaning propaganda and described these statements as a striking display of ineffective and grievance at the dawn of a presidency both cnn and abc news went into detail to refute mr spice's claims top trump <laughs> I don't, oh, <laughs> that's terrible wording oh my English. gosh i can yeah. Now I'm imagining. Now I'm imagining um, U.S. presidents top Trumps. <laughs> you've got Can like you you've got me? Obama, Bush, Bush Junior, Bush Senior, Clinton. Yeah. <laughs> I think what you Abraham do is you, bas- you basically swap over. You, you can swap the uh, the different so, so, departments and say, I've got um, the uh, the guy who does the evi- environment. I'll have your Mister Environment, and I want your. I've got Colin Powell. Who's, who's, who wants Colin Powell? I'll, yeah. trade, I'll trade Colin Powell. Uh, yeah, oh so you see, the, the, the various categories will be sort of height, mm. approval rating, bullshit factor, insanity, hand size. <laughs> the preponderance for knuckles to trail along the ground when walking. Glove size. <laughs> Abraham Lincoln, nine and a half. Ooh, those are big hands. Oh shit, I've got Trump. <laughs> He's got really big oh, hands. No. It just Trump there's just no figure. It's just it's just blank. You yeah. win it automatically. But the, the hand size is probably yeah. about a, a million and a half. <laughs> I think. Uh, yeah. Sources said there's only one card that Trump yeah. can beat with his hand with hand size, and that's Jeremy Beadle. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he has got tiny hands. What about Davros? Davros has got tiny hands as well. <laughs> You have to really open up the presidential um, um, definition there to include Davros. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so top Trump eyed Kellyanne Conway auto pro criticized the media in a feisty exchange on NBC. She was challenged by Chuck Todd on NBC's Meet the Press to say why Mr. Spice's first appearance had, be, had been to utter a probable falsehood. Again, a probable falsehood here meaning uh, Lie. propaganda. <laughs> Lie? Yeah, no, no, that's good. That's good. We've got lie. Um, to, to, if I if I may steal one of Trump's most famous quotes, wrong. If we're going to keep referring to our press secretary in those types of terms, I think we're going to have to rethink our relationship here. She said. That's <laughs> on Mr. Spicer's claims. Um, she said he had been presenting alternative facts. Once again, lie. Alternative facts are not facts; they are falsehoods. Todd replied. That's 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 no. just brilliant names, though. Kellyanne Conway and Chuck Todd here on NBC. <laughs> Chuck Todd. He sounds like he's got like a you know instead of a chin, another arm. What's under Chuck Todd's beard? Another fist. <laughs> no, what's what's no no no. What's under Chuck Todd's beard? Uh, journalistic integrity. Yeah. <laughs> It's just like the way she goes. I, I, I think we'll have to think, rethink our relationship here. So you can't come yeah. to our next party. Well, there'll be no one there if the press don't show. Well, it's <laughs> the thing. It's like they're all saying, they're all saying, "Oh, we're gonna, we're just not gonna tell you anything." And it's like, okay, fine. <laughs> That's what they. Sh- there was an interesting thing I read earlier about this, and it's kind of scary because these tactics have been used before <clears throat> by. Um, by um, very conservative peoples to oh, well, actually get the also press onto by their uh, side. the um, the Nazi party in 1933. Yeah, what was they, it called? They, they, they called they, um, something press. It was like um, lying press or something like that. Yeah, There's a German well, it's term like for it. When you when you deny media, when you deny the the newspapers 
um, anything. We deny them everything, and then you give them something. <laughs> it's it's like it, it's weirdly like it's weirdly like you know the whole um, the things they used to do with dogs, the really terrible experiments they used to do with dogs, where they'd starve them for ages and then give them food, and they just give them anything, and the dogs would do anything. <laughs> And eat anything, and it's just like it's disgusting. And, and this is what we're going to get onto. But if we don't stand up to it, we're going. It's going to end up like that. We're going to start getting the loss of integrity within the uh, news media. Have you seen the next paragraph? Oh yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Conway insisted. Ms. Conway, sorry, insisted there was no real. Uh, no way to really quantify crowds and taking offence at a laugh from the reporter she said you can laugh at me all the once it's symbolic of the way we are treated in the press the way you just laughed at me <laughs> I mean imagine what, how far you've got to push a reporter like somebody that's on TV a lot you know the whole point of being you know the reason we're not professional news reporters is that we couldn't suppress a giggle when somebody said something like that to us and even this guy who, who must be have years of experience to be front in NBC on the day of a presidential inauguration and then she goes there's no way to quantify crowds and the guy just went <laughs> Just like laughed out loud, couldn't even contain himself. He's been so careful to be sort of like, well, I don't think that's quite true all the way through it because we've got like photo. We're there, here. Look, look out the window. No fucker here. <laughs> and you're saying, yep. oh, you can't tell how many people are in a crowd. Yeah, but you could if you look at the picture of Obama's inauguration and and, and look out the window right now. It's a lot less people. I think we can agree on that. Well, you know, and then them then their press office going, well, lots of people are watching from around the world. Chuck it's Todd like, has been. I'm oh, sorry, just to give a bit of context here. This is probably explains why he couldn't suppress a giggle because it's just so bullshit. He's been a political. He's been a political editor and commentator in the news since 1992. So for more than 20 years. For more than 20 years, and that was that's probably the first time someone's ever said something to him that he, he actually couldn't help. But st he couldn't stifle <laughs> his. He couldn't suppress. I think that's. Um, do you remember that this is the this is the government that that did Nixon's trick, Donald Trump. And I, I want to I want to make this crystal clear, right? Donald Trump did Nixon's trick back when Nixon was um, in. Well, he was even when he was running for office. Sorry, he was in office. Um, Dan Rather asked Nixon a question. And I can't remember what it was. I'd have to look it up. And Nixon said, I'm not talking to you. And then moved on to the next person. The next person was Todd Brokaw. And Todd Brokaw said, uh, yes, um, will you answer Dan Rather's question? Yeah. And that's what we need. We need, we need the news media who are going to fight for truth to stand up and work for each other and work together they've got to protect each other because if they ain't going to protect each other themselves there's only so much we can do we can do whatever we can by supporting them but hopefully they're going to start properly working together because it, otherwise it's going to go fucking south real quickly yeah wow this is just, this is, <laughs> this whole thing is Donald Trump and his administration trying to rewrite history. This this whole thing of saying that, oh yeah, that there were more yeah. there were more people at this. That's, I can't believe the goal of it. That's trying to rewrite history the day, days after it's happened. Well, I think it was at the time as well. No one came mm. to my party. Sad. Hashtag no one came to my party. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, <laughs> yeah. And now they're they're sort of doing this. They're already doing this threatening shit. You know, Celia Trump ally Ted Malik told BBC that NATO would be reformed with the possibility of a new institution with a definite focus on ensuring European members pay more towards the alliance. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, it's just like, wow. Yeah. It's fucking mental. This, and it looks like they're still letting Donald Trump tweet. Fuck, you wouldn't let him near a computer, would you? It's like, oh, every time oh, boy. you sit down at a computer, can't you just like no. watch really terrible porn instead? That would just be better. <laughs> We'd far rather somebody discovered you were watching something real, you know, awful, something utterly indefensible than you, you know, having, you know, access and tweeting and sending stupid tweets. Less people came through in inauguration because... I th I'm, yeah, I'm pretty sure there might well have been more protesters at his inauguration than visitors. Probably. But you, uh, w one of the things that gives me hope, and I'm just been blown away by this, and it, it shows just how much we can do as a crew, as a people. The Women's March that was followed amazing. the um, and uh, yeah of the inauguration, not just in America but around the world, was absolutely incredible. That is one of the things we need. We need protest. Yeah, I mean, I'm, at Obama, Obama's um, inauguration, I suppose there would have been a few people protesting, maybe a few hundred or even a few thousand, would still have been a small I'd percentage. Conservatively, I'd say a few thousand. Yeah. Yeah, but the fact that millions of people in America and hundreds of thousands of people in the rest of the world protested Trump's inauguration, so more people protested it by, you know, a factor of, you know, possibly thousand to one. For every person that was there, there was at least a thousand people protesting Quite his probably, inauguration. Yeah. So it's yeah. a bit of a switcheroo, which is amazing. Oh, that's, a bit, you know, and already he's trying to rewrite and say, well, lots of people watched it on television. It's like, well, yeah, they possibly did just to see how few people turned up. I think his figure was fair, though, if you could count all the protest groups, if he was combining all those. Yeah, if you combine all the protesters. Yeah, then it's well over if, a million. If you count the protesters, well, maybe. people going to the yeah. inauguration, then you've got a couple of million, haven't you? Yeah. It was funny. There was a, a conversation, very short conversation on Twitter, and you'll understand why it was short in a moment. Where someone had said, oh, someone had posted those pictures and commented, oh, look at how how more popular Obama was to um, to Trump. Hmm. And someone from a, a Trump supporter replied saying, oh, well, that's because Tr that's because Trump supporters actually work and works in all capitals. And the original post replied and said, um, presidential inauguration day is a public holiday in America in Washington. Yeah. So no one works the day the president gets becomes president. No one. Everybody has that day off. Mm. If they all had that day off and couldn't be fucked to go to that, or didn't want to go to that all, you know. Wow. Yeah. yeah so. Is yeah. That the news items. That that sort of wraps it up for the news. I didn't have a lot of time this week to put together news stories. If you want to help out with news stories, either post them in the IRC at irc.freenode.net hash, hash R4NGER5 or you can send them to v4v at earthling.net and we're very grateful and we do credit any news story or any recommendia that we get. Um, and everybody's more, well, until we get like thousands of people wanting to be in, everybody's more than welcome to join us in the Mumble server and listen to the show live like Digital Whiskey is this evening. And we'll try mm -hmm. and keep up um, all the. Uh, we'll try and keep people. Up, um, oh, what was I going to say? All oh, right, okay. Back to people. You were talking about keeping people up to speed and stuff. Yeah, and we'll try and keep people up to speed when stuff's coming out a bit better than I did this week. But yeah, those things. It's it's been a busy week. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I best plug in this laptop. So we're going to have a break for a minute and play some as yet unspecified um, halftime music. Because we still didn't get that sorted out. But yeah, it should start getting better as, as mm -hmm. uh, we compile these things and get like a proper weekly show together. But, you know, we are on show four, so... Success through continuous small improvements. Yeah. Is our new rallying cry. But yeah, so so we're going to have a break. Uh, but we probably need, all need to drink something, and, and then we'll come back with our discussion, which is the rise of fascism and Nazism in yeah. uh, the UK and other places, with our special guest um, 
um, here, Weaver of Webs. In theory. In theory, possibly. Okay, so I'm going to stop the recording and we're going to play some music.
now. I don't know why I said I'm going to start recording now, because uh, a little thing comes up saying recording started. Yep. So, <laughs> somewhat superfluous. Is it stay on everybody's screen? Yeah, it's, it's a little... Yeah, it did. I see. Yeah. So we're on. We're doing our thing. And uh, as, as is tradition to the running order, uh, as laid down by the uh, strictures of rant media... <laughs> We all obviously worship. Um, a newsreel's going on. It's going on on this Mumble server, I, I think. Yeah. I don't know when. I've, I've really got to sort of get better at that. Uh, so um, we're going to do the discussion. Yeah. Uh, which this week is uh, all about the rise of. Would you call it fascism or would you say it's Nazism? Yeah. No, I say. I say. No, I'd say fascism. Yeah. <laughs> The, the the rise to prominence of fascism. Hmm. I'm not not meaning to down. I'm. Um, I don't want to in any way make it appear that this is something that's just happened overnight because it hasn't. Um, I, I feel it's been ha it's been brewing under the surface for a long time, hmm. and the last couple of years, starting with Game Again, um, has led to a resurgence not a resurgence uh, the led to fascists and nazis believing that they can be a voice in the world um and that's something we have to recognize and we have to stop this is yeah. like this is 100% actually terrible. It is, it is an extremely bad thing when people believe that by um, other people remaining silent when they say the things that they say, they take that as tacit agreement. Yeah. That, that's essentially which, what's happened. Which, which, which that is, is what's what happened. arguably how fascism works. I mean, Adam yeah. Moore described fascism as the complete surrendering of the franchise and your political will to the state or the power the power that you're choosing to represent you it's a complete subversion of the of, of the the responsibility uh, of the individual politically whereas anarchy is the complete opposite it's the absolute responsibility of your in, in individual actions so yeah um obviously it's a bad thing but it's also tied up in the whole freedom of speech thing as well unfortunately Unfortunately, yes, and they think this is this is all all boils down to a basic misunderstanding of what freedom of speech actually is. Mm. Um, and I've seen it put very 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 eloquently by people of them and myself. But there's two facets to freedom of speech, at least as it's enshrined in. U.S. in the U.S. because we, we we in Britain don't have such a thing as freedom the free, freedom of speech enshrined in enshrined in um, enshrined in a constitution because we don't have a constitution. Um, but the freedom of speech that's in the constitution in America is basically there to prevent the government censorship. Yeah, it's pre to prevent the government from censoring you. It's not there to allow you to say whatever you want unchallenged. That is not freedom of speech. Yeah, freedom of speech you, doesn't you, doesn't give you the right not to be called an asshole for your opinion. Yeah, is the basic and it thing. It, and it and it doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that your opinion will get unchallenged at all by anything. The the people who people who say that. Okay, so for instance, what's happened is you have you've had we've had um, white nationalists and fascists, oh, and Nazis, yeah. well, right, who have yeah, been I'm... trying to have um, talks in places, universities, for example, um, and they've been protests against them, and they've said, "Oh, these these protests are restricting our freedom of speech." I'm afraid they ain't sunshine. That's entirely within freedom of speech those people are allowed to protest and if a 
if a if a if a group of people who run the place that you want to do your talk at decide that they don't want you to talk there because you're because of what you're talking about, that isn't censorship either. Because I'm afraid it's private property, and they're allowed to do what they want on private property within the law. And the law doesn't extend to you being able to force them to let you talk about some absolutely abhorrent bullshit. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, because there's no restrictions on what you can say, say, on a YouTube channel, politically. Mm, there is now. It's oh. getting, it's getting better. There are, it's, the restrictions are kind of getting in the right direction. They're not massively great but they're getting in the right direction it's like no that they're really cracking down on the racism and the prejudice and homophobia and transphobia and shit like that hmm. that's the sort of stuff there are restrictions against yeah i mean the the universal defense is that if you stop me from having a platform to speak then you're re- restricting my freedom of speech the danger with restricting even one person's freedom to broadcast on a on a on a sort of thing that requires you to search for it is that you know then should the winds change and should you know sort of um somebody actually manage to put through something you know to uh (laughs) to you know like that guy who was saying oh these are all the machinations of big gay you know Mm -hmm. they were talking about sort of homosexuality being discussed in schools you know, if you say sort of like one group of people cannot speak on this particular platform, then there's nothing to stop them saying another group of people can't speak on this particular platform. Yeah. So, um, I'm all for if a university no, decides is- not to speak. I mean, if you, if there is a, a say a lecture on a university campus, I mean, I'll give a recent example of Jermaine Greer wanting to speak on a university campus. Mm-hmm. Now, because Jermaine Greer holds some views that aren't particularly popular. I mean, she's Jermaine has... Greer, the turf, you mean? Yeah. Let, let's get it out there. Jermaine Greer, the reason why they want, didn't want Jermaine Greer in there mm. was because she's a trans exclusionary radical feminist. Yeah. That's why. Not that she's a feminist. Let's get that out there. Not because she's a feminist. It's purely because she's trans exclusionary. Yeah. That's the problem. Now she's prejudiced. That's, the option that's the was. Issue. You know, if it now if it had been a mandatory part of a university course that you attend the talk, that's one level of it. Yeah, that would that would not be fair. But if a better thing would have been to let her talk to an empty room, hmm. would have been a, a more damning indictment rather than some people protesting and the talk being withdrawn. You know, to make it the responsibility of the individual whether to go or not would have been better, in my opinion. Okay. Than to ban someone outright for talking on it at campus. Or, you know, because at least if she talked, people could have disagreed in the Q&A section. Which mm-hmm. would have been far more public. Whereas for a group of people to protest and have that talk withdrawn... Gives it the look of censorship. Whereas if people self decide that they're not going to go and listen to her, then that's that's true, sort of um, sort of open market dissent, if you like. It's yeah. a much more telling thing. If someone as famous as Jermaine Greer turns up to give a talk, I think it was Bath University or something like that, somewhere like that, and nobody had turned up, would have been a far more positive message. Than saying I'm sorry, we've declined, we've decided to withdraw our invitation because f- some people have protested. Now those people had every right to protest and say, look, this is what's going to be discussed at this, and it's not a very good message. And for them, the people that were choosing to attend the talks to not go would have been a far more damning message and far more effective. So you know, she could maybe think about her opinions. It's kind of interesting that Jermaine Greer is is being protested against. Um, by people that would consider themselves to be feminists rather than in the 70s where people protest against Jermaine Greer speaking because she was a feminist views on that uh, art program where she was seemed to be almost heterosexual in her views on uh... no I just I, I noticed that she was on a, an art program and she was um, seemed to be a different 
a different kettle of fish than she was before. Her, her feminist views didn't seem to be fitting with the um, the comments that she was coming out with. So. Yeah, I mean, but that's you know that's the problem with uh, it's it being a person that, rather than an ideal or the contents of a book. Mm. People change over time; their viewpoints change, and people try and say that they don't, but they do. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's that's just that's an example that I would give to sort of say this this is something that bears you know considerable thinking about. I mean to out and out say we must you know to go all Nuremberg on it and say there must be blood in the streets and stuff like that, like Mosley did when think, he decided to go down Brick Lane. I think the best thing to do is just go and burn all the books. Really, that's the yeah. answer. Because I mean <laughs> that's that's the only way a, a rational thinking yeah, I'm, um, democracy. I wouldn't even be comfortable with the burning do. of a copy of Mein Kampf. Yes. Um, no, I. I and then smash no. a few windows, then that's yeah, yeah, right <laughs> the next thing, really. I, think, okay, I just want to smash, smash, smash. smash. <laughs> Your Fight Club homework for today. <laughs> but Sylvia, pa- yeah. um, Emmeline Pankhurst and the other Pankhurst sister, during the mm-hmm. First World War, gave out white feathers to young men not in uniform. Mm. Yeah. You know, as soon as the first... The only person that protested against the First World War was Sylvia Pankhurst. Mm-hmm. Who then became Minister for Women in Ethiopia yeah. under the Haile Selassie government? <laughs> Interesting woman, but yeah, it's it is that sort of thing. You've got a person being a person in front of people, and their views are not always going to coincide. And now, on, and I'm not saying they weren't really hurtful comments, but just you know, to, you've got to put it in perspective of someone. And it's a it's a horrible defence, but someone of that era who was used to being everything being very very monochrome and you know men versus women, yeah, and then being asked to sort of deal with something that if you live in Australia you don't often encounter, but that but the, to then for someone with that much media sat media sort of like experience to then just basically discredit a whole group of people was a bit stupid. But I would have, I would, as I said before, I'd much rather have seen her talking to a, a, a footage of her talking to maybe two people in a whole, in, in a whole audience hall. Mm. Yeah. Or people turning up but actually choosing to disagree. I think that's why I was you know, using my trickster, my trickster energy there, saying about the burning of the books and things. And basically, yeah, yeah. what I was saying was <laughs> that sometimes you have to allow people the e- exchange of views and things purely because um, you. Don't, you don't get to know who a person is or their views anyway. If you if you keep constantly banning something, mm. the whole of the um, whole of the alternative generation would have been um, suppressed and shut away, like Oz I mean, and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, I mean, how much more satisfying would it be if, say, Nigel Farage got into the Oxford Union, which is a, quite a famous talk place for people to talk? Yeah, said his piece without interruption. And then somebody just stood up and say, right, so everybody that thinks what Nigel just said is a whole bunch of horse shit, put up their hands. And an mm. entire room full of people raise their hands and go, yes, you are full of horse shit, Nigel. It's much better than censorship. It's sort of like, because that would be a truly amazing thing that we'd never have to live down. And if he thought that there was that sort of chance of it happening, he might as a person change, or he might even mm-hmm. outwardly change. And then he wouldn't say these things Unless he was absolutely, he'd have to be in, a, in an environment where he was absolutely sure people yeah. would agree. He wouldn't have to be beaten up and brutalised as Hitler was as a child by his father. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, well, this is the thing. It's like Farage has had that though. This this is a scary thing. Is that Farage has had that? He's had the debates where he's been able to say it's a piece entirely, and no one's agreed with him. Hmm. And because it doesn't fit with his worldview, he just ignores it. Yeah, but I, th- I you know, when you've got someone that delusional you you then need someone you know you need the, the other person to counter it mm. and sort of like say now here is the voice of reason you need to put it forward yeah. as a Labour I... Labour Prime Minister and then you can go on and believe <laughs> uh, okay. you've it, got God the... on his side yeah I think the problem is is that we're not as uh, the these people when they are allowed to talk about patently wrong things aren't being followed up with this is patently wrong mm. 
and this is why in Labrador speak. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, it's not. I, it's not, I, I, it's not I, I am breaking Green's law, which says that if any sentence begins with "if everybody," then mm-hmm. the thing that you're talking about will never work. But, yep. you know, I'm talking about an idealised world where, you know, people yep. would be educated in critical thinking enough to go, well, hang on, that can't be right. Mm-hmm. Um, and the only thing I've ever seen that would ever counter it um, was in one of Robert Heinlein's books, A Stranger in a Strange Land, where they have a group of people called Fair Witnesses. And when somebody says something is so like in a court of law or in a newspaper interview, if there's a fair witness there, the fair, fair witness says, you know, the, what they see as the truth based on the actual <laughs> evidence that is mm-hmm. at hand. So if you said, what colour is that house to a fair witness, they might say, <coughs> the side of the wall, the wall that's facing us, the bit of it that I can see is white. I can't tell you about anything else apart from that. So uh, yeah. in, in that example, in, for instance, say if Nigel Farage got up and said all these people need to go because they're not only are they taking our jobs, but they're also um, all on benefits, which is a neat trick. They've come mm-hmm. here to scrounge the welfare state and take our jobs at the same time. So yep. it's, I think it's one or the other, Nigel. Um, then it maybe some are doing one and some are doing the other. Yeah. But it's, a, it's a two-pronged attack. <laughs> so... Uh, so a fair witness would say, right, here are the statistics, here are the, here's the information as of the Department of Work and Pensions, here's the amount of tax that immigrants have paid into the thing, and here is the amount of welfare they've taken out. And here is the amount of welfare that white people take out of the system, and here is the amount of tax white people pay on a comparative ratio. So mm-hmm. you could then see whether, you know, immigrants were a couple of percent either way. And then you, yep. you, you know, if you agree to those sorts of rules, then it would, you know, it wouldn't matter. But you'd also have to have a populace that a populace that was trained to respond to the words of a fair witness. Yeah, but we don't. So, we're in, so but we don't exist. We've got in that a population world. that, yeah, we've What's got a population brunette, that responds to. What? Is that a brunette? It's not so good. What? Instead of fair. All oh, right, a brunette. It's not oh, a brunette. Right. Witness. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, we've got a, a society that's trained to respond to sensationalist media. Yeah, and TV and, you know, the sides mm. of buses. The sides of buses. Yes. But I I, I, I fight shy of thinking about um, censorship, really, because I think quite a lot of the uh, fringe groups that we now, at the moment, have got um, kind of like popular support. In, in days of my... Um, upbringing would be if Mary Whitehouse and people like that had away would be um, wouldn't have had this way that they have now because they, they wouldn't have even got a foot in the door as far as um, popularity or even finding their voices so yeah I mean, not- to be fair we're not really talking about censorship per no. Se. No. we're talking about the use of freedom of speech as in that I should be able to tell you know basically shout yeah. down anybody that I think disagrees we, yeah, with we- me Hmm. Yeah, we've got we've got this track. Yeah, yeah, it is We're, that. It is that. Which is the second the, breaking of Green's law. You know, if everybody yeah. was prepared to be fair, then this thing this wouldn't even be an issue because the first Nazi would poke their head above the parapet, and uh, you know they would say bloody bloody blah bad things Jewish people or black people, and everybody would shout them down and go ah oh, fuck off, and it wouldn't get yeah. ten paces. The problem is, is that you've got scared, undereducated people, people that only get their information from the news or things like that, or the newspapers or the front cover of the Daily Mail, and really buy into it. You know, I've, I've heard of people, uh, you know, sort of like being very angry that there's such a thing as a prayer room in most office buildings now. Mm. You know, so, oh, it's just for the Muslims. And it's like, well, if you really wanted to protest it, whining about it and sounding like a bigot is not the way to go. The way to yep. go would be to either set up your own religion where you have to pray 10 times a day and you have to take 10 five-minute breaks in every workday to go and pray. Mm-hmm. Um, but the reality is that the majority... I've, I've, not, I've never seen anybody in the prayer room. No, I haven't seen any in the... I've seen some in our prayer room. But, um... but you know, it's a bit like, uh, you know, that prayer room could be used by a Christian or a Jew as easily as a Muslim. Oh, or a pagan. Yeah, or a pagan, for that matter. Or a believer in the flying spaghetti monster. Mm. Yeah. 
It's up there with the argument about unisex toilets. People freaking out because there are unisex toilets. And all the unisex toilets I've ever seen are one stall in its own yeah. room. So it Except doesn't yeah. the absolutely it fucking doesn't matter who's yeah. in there. Do you do you want to go and watch them take a dump? <laughs> there are this many toilets, you may all use them. You know. Um, and in where I work at the moment, and it's a restaurant as unisex toilets now. Mm. The most of the coffee shops I've ever been into have a toilet or two toilets, and those are unisex. Yep. There isn't a men's or a women's anymore. That wasn't a very d- difficult change. Um, basically, the only change, if it was always you know an actual toilet rather than a urinal, was levering the picture of the little guy off the door. Mm-hmm. That's the, all the work that had to be done for that to be achieved. That's. <laughs> Exactly. That's all there is. You know how much more? How much work was that? We just have to take a sign off a door, and just instead yeah. just put the word "toilet" in the front. Was that so hard? No. So is that a solution mm. for nationalism? And mm. hmm. um, you know, so I mean, there's always been sporadic things of nationalism or fascism or nazism however whatever you want to attach to it spurring up ever you know ever since there have been political parties so in the in the sort of like in the 50s and 60s it was mosley when was the rivers of blood speech by enoch powell i thought that was about 80s something 1980 uh, i could google it it's being googled as we speak can you hear the clattering it is being 1968 oh wow that is earlier than that that was during the windrush thing Mm. it's also 68 was around the time of the american backlash and all the um kent university and things like that where the um the war in um vietnam Vietnam started hotting up and also they shot those students at the kent uh, university yeah And where, um, it was in relate relation to the race relations relations bill, nineteen sixty eight. Mm. Yeah. Well, Kent State was about Vietnam. There mm-hmm. was University of Alabama. There was a full blown fucking riot. And who was it? When was the bus in? In was that around that time or afterwards? That's about then, about nineteen sixty seven. And, you know, they, they were doing the whole, it will never work, you can't have black people and white people being educated in the same room and stuff like that. There's stuff that seems really quaint and hmm. and ridiculous now. Yeah. But even more ridiculous in a state like Alabama with a high percentage, I mean, it's a majority of black people in Alabama. The white, uh, the white population is in a minority. Hmm. And they were insisting that this whole university was just for white people and, you know, they ended up bussing in black students to go to Alabama University. There's even a scene Somebody's in Forrest Gump on the food counters, aren't they? Mm-hmm. I'm trying to remember who it was. There is a famous politician. I might have to Google this. There's a famous politician that was the guy that was speaking out about um, other students in Alabama. It was the Ohio 8 or something, was it? Ohio 8. June 11th, 1963. It's very early. Uh, yeah, George Wallace. Oh, yes, that's right. Governor George Wallace. He actually ran for president as well. <laughs> Well, he's a proper, you know, he promises white fair f- followers segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. And when Af- African American students attempted to desegregate the Univali- University of Alabama in June 1963, Alabama's new governor, flanked by state troopers, literally blocked the door of the enrollment office. Um, the US Supreme Court, however, declared segregation unconstitutional in Brown versus Board of Education. And the executive branch undertook aggressive tactics to re- enforce the ruling. Was Wallace the one that beat them all up on the bridge when um, um, Martin Luther King was doing his walk for a peace walk across the... Um, I think you might be right, actually. Mm. The Million Man March. And Are we going away from our subject, though, or do you think it's germane to the... Oh, germane. Germane. Oh, we'll be back to her again. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Um, 
yeah, so George Wallace um, was a was a really famous figure, very briefly um, mentioned in all sorts of movies that depict the era in America because he was a hugely controversial figure. He was like properly racist and mentioned by Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. And in a, you know, based on the, you know, these were people that had been in America just as long as anybody as, as he had been, as, as his ancestors. What had was been that in latest America. film that they did? Was that called The Walk or something? The um... Because that one, I think, it has him um, in his interaction with the um, with the president at the time. Um, but I could be making it all up. I mean, that's a hundred years after the Emancipation Proclamation. Mm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, after you know, it, it was, if you watch Forrest Gump very carefully, when he goes to university on his first day in university, that's what happens. Yeah, he's. And there is very famous footage of it, of George Wallace standing in front of the courthouse. Hmm. And uh, one of the students drops their books and then they manage to paste in Tom Hanks as Forrest Gump picking up her books. Um, and this wonderful interaction that's sort of like, you know, sort of, you know, all the guys in the shower going, they know they're going to have coons at this university. And he goes, raccoons? <laughs> yeah, they'll get into the yeah. bins and everything. <laughs> and it's, you know, so they're, they're sort of that... And that's not even, you know, sort of like when Americans do that in America to other Americans, that's not exactly fascism. It's racism, mm -hmm. but it's not mm -hmm. a xenophobic. You know, these people are here. They did, you know, weren't trying to get rid of the, you know, black people out of Alabama. They just didn't. They wanted segregation. It's the whole um, Rosa Parks thing, mm -hmm. you know, that kicked off, that more or less kicked off the civil rights movement in its entirety. I don't think they wanted some black people in Alabama. Yeah. The ones that were. A pity, as they would say. Picking cotton. Hmm. And there's um, a really fabulous movie about what if slavery was still um, in effect. What's it called? It's a really amazing documentary, and I think we talked about it before, but before I went off grid. Uh... Amazing documentary. What's an evil war? Right. Was that the second one down? I think it's that one. CSA. Confederate States of America. <laughs> there's there's some record media for you. It's actually called CSA, Confederate States of America. It's playing on my ears before it's playing on yours. Made by the Weinstein Company. Hmm. Already. Yeah. I should download that. Yeah. So the Weinstein Company made a documentary about if the American, the South had won the Civil War and if slavery was still in effect and they did all sorts of amazing things so that's worth a worth a look an hour and a half of anybody's money but i think yeah. we've we've uh, plugged it on rangers before i think we have yeah. but it is out there on youtube just look up csa confederate states of america it will come straight up because it's public domain now your connection was down yeah so yeah interesting stuff um, but Nazism well, yeah. in the UK has, has flared up all the time. I mean, not not just um, Enoch Powell. Also, uh, um, Oswald although, Mosley. Although en Enoch Powell wouldn't think himself as being a, a purporter of... Uh, no, because he, he refused to join the British Union yeah, of Fascists. Yeah. Um, but his views were in some ways allied to um, the thinking along that way he claimed he was thinking about the future of the United Kingdom mm. and he said that if, if lots and lots of black people or lots and lots of Asian people or Chinese people came to this country they would be hopelessly unable to integrate which uh, yeah is bollocks yeah um, <laughs> you know and the weird thing is is when those big spurs of integration like the Windrush um, from the West Indies and the in influx of people from India and Pakistan that was by request 
the British mm. government deliberately you know made it easier mm. to emigrate to the UK because especially after the war we had a sudden dearth of people to do all sorts bus of conductors. jobs. They bus conductors. Bus conductors and train drivers. Jamaica. If you lived in London yeah. in the 1960s, 70s and 80s, you were so likely to see a West Indian man on the, as, as a bus conductor yeah. or a bus driver or a tube driver or working on the underground or working somewhere on the railways to the point that when they did station announcements... It was up Oliver Art. It was yeah, in a really was. beautiful... It was fantastic... Yeah. Um, West Indian Patois a lot of the time. Yeah. A lot of the actual station announcers and the recordings of station announcers were in with with a West Indian accent. Mm. I, I distinctly remember hearing, especially the train lines you were waiting for, you know, mm. Strawberry Hill, Upper Alford Alt. Yes. Full well up. Peckham Ray. Peckham Ray. It was just absolutely fantastic. And all the announcements were over the tube tannoy and stuff like that. So, you know, sort of like there were, you know, it, it was unusual to see a bus conductor that wasn't black. I think that's probably because we went over there specifically to get people to come back over here. So um, we actually recruited people in that country and brought yeah. them back. And the same for the nurses and things like that yeah. later on, I think. Um, <coughs> however, are we straying away from the shows are, yeah. Again? So um, so the there were Oswald Mosley with the black shirts, yeah, which had come out mm -hmm. of the cult of the Kibo Kift, yeah, I saw which that. was a hippie yeah. movement, <laughs> <laughs> and basically scouts for grown ups, really. Did you point that out when yep. you were in, in when we were in Leeds? There, there was a thing in the picture, People's Museum, yeah. Oh, in the, in in Manchester, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, there was a, a thing about the Kibo Kift. Which was a, a self-reliance organisation. It was it was like uh, West Country Rednecks. Uh, precious few people of colour in that. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, when the National Front sort of decided to kick off in the nineteen seventies. Yeah, it should have been around. That no, sixty-six. You, you said you, you were. You were Google. I think, you, did we say 68, 69 or something like that? That was the Rivers of Blood speech. Oh, not sure. Look for Red Line Square incident or something. Oh, that looks promising. Red Line Square riot. Red Line Square disorders, it's been downgraded. Yeah. For a series of events in 1974. Oh. On 15th of June that year, the National Front marched through London's West End. Their march was to finish with a meeting in Conway Hall, Hall oh, Red Line yeah. Square, yeah. on the Lon London Aerial Council for we Liberation. The counter demonstration, which consisted of a march through London, ending with a public meeting in Red Line Square. There you go. Hmm. You were there. I was. There were police on horseback and skinheads. Police on horseback, beating people with big batons and uh, people running. Running about madly all over the place, but uh, the police again were into their idea of kettling, but this time in in the way that they orchestrated the way that you walked around the road, so they kept you um, blocked to some extent. And then when we were kind of like stuck in one place confronting them, that's when they came in with the horses and charged, and that guy got injured. I'm not sure if he died or if he just got injured on that day. Kevin Gateway, might be, yeah, yeah. I can't yeah he died. The guy's name. Yeah, I think I think he died. Yeah. But yes, it was a, it was a definite, um, a definite uh, incident for the police to try and cause as much mayhem as possible. And also, the, in, in that when when the um, when the demonstration was petering out, I noticed that the police were following the IMG group, the International Marxist group, was mm -hmm. veering off somewhere else, and and the police were following. So I think there was another fracas with them. Like, I suppose we've got the Battle of Red Line Square now. Oh, it's, it's been constantly redefined. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Kevin Gately, a 21-year-old student from Warwick University, was not a member of any political group, and this was his first attendance at a political event. He came with a group of friends attached to an IMG contingent was caught up in the first clash in Red Line Square. Photos show Gately moving through the crowd, possibly trying to escape from the tight press of bodies during the pushing at the police cordon. 
His unconscious body was found by the police after the crowd was driven back and taken into an, to an ambulance to University College Hospital. Lately's fellow students only realised he was missing when they, they met after the demonstration ended. Um, With their policeman's buttons, which he ripped off the... Hemming gave his death was the result of a blow to their from a blunt instrument. Many suspect this was a police truncheon. Police mm, I reckon it was one of those. Um, saying that Gately was found to have an unusually thin skull at certain points, and his death was a tragic accident. And on the following Saturday, a vigil traced the route of um, the protest. Yeah. It's a matter of historical fact. That was there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I'd already been politicalised um, many years ago with the um, magazines, it and Oz and things like that, and um, just not believing in the uh, establishment's records of what actually happened. Things like um, mm -hmm. Bloody Sunday in Ireland and. Uh, yeah, I mean, like that, that it was a new thing for people to, you know, in the 50s and early 60s, people just went along with what the government wanted mm. to do and said, oh, that's the way it's got to be. And then all of a sudden, people became, you know, to use the modern term, radicalised and decided that, you know, a bunch of people from Eton and Harrow were not possibly the best people to make those decisions for them. And boy, did the, did the you know, the, the establishment freak out at that idea. will now reflect on the words of Only a Pawn in Their Game <laughs> by Bob Dylan. Yeah. The Bob Dylan be out of line. Way, way out way of line. Out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I suppose to be fair, luckily, the National Front hasn't really had a foot in the door, really, to, to that extent in, in Britain as, as much as it could have done. Um, and maybe that's true no. to the um, the working man's in those days um, less acceptance of um, of these images of people, you know, and not needing that particular ultra right element to their lives. Well, that kind of fascism really only works when you've got someone with some charisma that goes, "Ah, these things are bad," and people are too lazy to say that's complete bollocks. <laughs> That is unfortunately what we're seeing. We're seeing those people with charisma creep out of the woodwork. I find it slime. weird that Trump is considered to have charisma, or Nigel Farage has charisma. Sorry, I don't. I don't mean Trump specifically. Yeah, um, I think. I think. I the, think Farage has got that sort of. There's an energy there that is. Um, he's quite upbeat in in the way he comes across to people, and. Um, Maybe he's realised, um, as far as interviews and things, how to get himself to look like he's a man of uh, of intelligence and also a man that can tell what the common man wants. What was a good term, isn't that common yeah. man? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm thinking more less less Trump, more people like Richard Spencer, and uh, Milo Yiannopoulos, Steve Bannon, who's now the who's now Trump's. Um, Press well, not uh, what he's in there and his press stuff. Well, yeah, I, I do wonder whether if you've got someone that's so wholly unacceptable like Donald Trump, whether somebody in a suit not spouting obvious bullshit sounds more reasonable. Hmm. You know, it's sort of like that. Mike Pence looks like a reasonable guy <laughs> stood next to Donald Trump. Yeah, that's the thing that's kind of scary. Now, Mike Pence, I wouldn't put past. But he's definitely a white nationalist. Trump maybe not, but Mike Pence properly 100% is a white nationalist. Yeah. I think I think Trump could be anything. Yeah. As long as there's a profit margin and as long as there's the necessary mm. um, charisma attached to or the... Um, I think Trump's sole advantage is that he's not a politician. He's not very good. And, and he's massively ignorant of what it means to be a politician in modern America. And I think people warm to that. I think they're 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 going on the whole Mr. Smith goes to Washington, Jimmy Stewart. I don't know anything yeah. about any of this, but I'm sure going to go in there and drain that swamp. Yeah, and that's I think that's all he had to say. It's just a shame that it wasn't someone that was you know a decent human being. Hmm. 
Because I think anybody that had some sort of recognition in America as being a decent, upstanding sort of a person could have walked, could have stood on that podium and said, I'm just going to go drain that swamp and could have won. And unfortunately, yeah. they picked someone so horrific. I'm wondering whether they picked someone deliberately horrific so that they knew that he'd never make it through the four years. I mean, it's the, unlikely. Well, the I guy that predicted this Trump would win against all odds, you know, because everybody mm -hmm. was basically saying, oh, it'd be near run thing, but Hillary's obviously going to win because you can't elect a loony like Trump. One professor in England actually said, look, he's going to win. Mm -hmm. And he's been right about every single election for the past 30 years. Yeah. And his his comment now, because he's now an advisor, a political advisor to somewhere like uh, CNN or Fox News or something, when they, whenever they want to know what's going to go down, he literally goes away and does all the sums and tells them what's going to go down. And he's mm -hmm. he, this same guy is basically going, no, he won't make it the full four years without being impeached and thrown out of office. So is it that the Republican party know for a fact Trump won't make it through his his presidency but they then know that the person that will be in charge will it will automatically fall to Mike Pence I was having this Who discussion is... with my partner yesterday um, and this was, we essentially came to the same conclusion he, Donald Trump will not make four years he will either be impeached and thrown out of office or he will die from the stress of the job. Let's not forget that he's 70 years old. There has yeah. not been a president elect that old in living in in as far as I as far as I can remember. Going back to all the presidents I can I could remember to the back of the tw to the start of the 20th century, no president was that old when they took office. There may right. have been some presidents before the 20th century, but none in this century or the last century. Do you know what's really terrible that about old. that? Imagine if he does die of stress in office because of all the opposition to his presidency. Mm -hmm. He is going to be hailed as a martyr, for one. So you won't be able yeah. to, if he does die, you won't ever be able to say anything bad about Donald Trump ever again. And two, it would have been the um, sort of like the, the left-leaning people that protested it that will be have killed the president. Well, it's it's less and likely that it will be. Sorry, it's less likely that it's going to be stress from that. It's more likely it's just going to be stress from the job itself. <laughs> yeah, but who do you think they're they... going to blame? Oh no, exactly. Yeah, no, they no, will twist Trump it to make it look year, like two years of continuous assault on every possible medium. Loads of people, everybody from feminists to black people to. You know, people. Mm -hmm. You know, gays. You know, they will literally reel off all of Trump's enemies that made the job so stressful for him. And a tearful Ivanka of Trump will be on the on the podium saying, "If only people could have tried, let him try and do the job and shit like that." And that will have two functions. One, it will it will authorize violence against those groups. Yeah. You killed our president. That's an American type thing. You're just as bad as it's authorized, isn't it? What? It's a different word. It's not authorised, it's a house, but similar words. Yeah, different feel entitled mm. to have a part um, of anybody that represents those groups. Oh, what is the word? Gosh, and also, it. people will be wary of criticising the next president if they look a bit doddery. Mm. Mm. People will be wary of protesting in such massive numbers. You know, that will kill pro protesting in America dead. If he, if he dies in office as a result of all the stress... Well, has he withdrawn all the um, things already? Then he withdrawn all the um, positive things for all the groups, all the dissimilar. Yeah, for instance, yeah, every yeah. mention of um, homosexuals, every mention of equality between mm. races, everything's been stripped out of the White House website. Mm. Now, as a as a, just a thing, <laughs> there is like something going around saying that that may just be that they're updating it, but. We'll see in like a week. I'm leaning to the likelihood that it's just been taken down entirely, and it's not going to go back up. But mm -hmm. it could be. But it could all be back up in a week. Yeah. But so. The, uh, I mean, these things do have a habit of rising. But I think in in the last year there have been two instances where this general sort of fear, this sort of fascistic sort of leaning that a few people have that other people have not agreed with and forcefully disagreed with forcefully enough or been loud enough about it at the time. Yeah. 
I think that's the problem, is that people... We, we, we haven't been loud enough in disagreeing with it. Pos- quite probably. I was. Well, yeah, we, we, yeah. There was a there was an incident where when I, in my previous job where after the Brexit vote came in, my my team leader came in and started taking off every taking people had loads of stuff from Europe like European ham and Evian water and stuff like mm. that and he just went round with a bin and chucked all of their European shit in the bin. Mm-hmm. And just walking what? around going, you can't have any of this shit. You vote, you vote. You know, did you vote leave? Did you vote? Then no, you can't have your Evian water. Where's that ham from? Product of France. You can't have that shit either. And just started binning all this European stuff to point out to people that, you know, this is basically what was going to happen. He was pro stay. He was going, yeah. you'd be drinking Evian water near me if you voted to leave. Fuck off. You can't have that. He was <laughs> furious. Just started basically <laughs> going through people's desks and taking out any shit that was from Europe and going, no, you don't get to have, you know, French bread or any shit like that. No brioche yeah. for you. Fuck you. You couldn't be bothered to either vote or vote against. <laughs> Yeah, and then I think somebody said I didn't think my vote would count, and he went ballistic. What do you, what oh, the fuck yeah. do you think a vote is? <laughs> this is the thing. I think for a whole day, votes always count. You know, I mean, the only way they don't count is if, if <laughs> the only way a vote doesn't count is if it actively fucked with. I mean, After that in itself, voted. the whole whether we should stay in Europe is is not the issue particularly. No, it's not. It's the permission that pe- some people have felt that that's given them to be openly racist yeah it's like I'll, I'll, I'll parrot something that someone said and I think it's worth saying people in UKIP is not comprised entirely of white supremacists and fascists however yeah. the majority of white supremacists and fascists are in UKIP yeah that's that's the distinction. Yeah, it's you've a got pretty make. damning Venn diagram. Yeah. And I'm not well, saying as, as a Brexit yeah. supporter. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you I can just, be a Brexit supporter, it doesn't you know? No, I was. We're not, I, was we're not, I was a, uh, a yeah. supporter of Brexit because I feel that if we don't, if we try and hang on to our um, our shores, we're not going to find the new horizons. I think um, Britain has become a service industry now. We don't have industries. Um, our only uh, exportable industries are maybe our ideas or our concepts. Mm. Um, but we're kind of like still playing the emperor's new clothes. And that's why when the hedge funds failed, um, we folded so easily, I think, because we didn't have that structure there. There wasn't any of our own stuff to fall back on. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I I agree with you on that. I just, I just personally, I don't see that as a a fault of Europe. I see that as a fault of the Tory party. Hmm. Because it's it's them who have taken those things. The, Thatcher got rid of those industries that we had. The manufacturing industry. She engineered the fall of those industries and us pushing towards a service industry. And since since Brexit Theresa May hasn't done any better. In fact, she's trying to. It's almost like she's trying to become Thatcher version two. I'm. I'm worried about what will happen after Brexit, after Article Fifty is triggered. But if the country does get better, I will put my hands up and say I was wrong. I will easily do that, but I'll stand by. Stand by my vote. To, to remain that's you know I just think the government's more at fault than Europe ever was in my opinion but yeah that sort of uh, I mean to get to drag the conversation screaming and kicking back Once to the again, sort of like the rise of the third, Nazism the fourth time yes yeah <laughs> But uh, yeah, I mean, so it, it does rise up and it only flourishes when not enough people say that's bollocks yeah so Everyone. the only solution to it is whenever something is genuinely bollocks, you just say, I'm sorry, that's bollocks. Mm. You know, you, you, you're talking absolute shite. It's not down to the colour of a person's skin or where they might have been from. None of these problems are the fault of things. Your, your, your problem, the reason you're not getting paid as much, the reason you have fewer jobs, is because your government has basically got rid of all the heavy industry in this country. Yeah. 
and we can't manufacture even a quarter of the things we need in this country to carry on in the lifestyle that we've become accustomed to. And you're no good at selling pegs. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what about some pegs? Can't even. Can't even. Can't even. Can't even sell pegs anymore. Can't even what? I can't. Oh, you can't even do that anymore now with the Enclosures Act. Yeah. Can't have gypsies. Can't right. No common can't man. Have gypsies. It's all owned by someone. Yeah. That was the government fucking with our with our rights. Yeah. More than two hundred years ago. I think. Is, does that even go for the um? Those little rules over the um, the grazing and the yeah, that's things. what the enclosures act was about. Mm. Basically, um, to bring anybody else that's doing, listening up to speak, they're still doing it in New Forest, though, aren't they? That's like there. Um, the New Forest is is a, an area of special conservation where there is common land if you live there. Mm. Um, it's an exception because it was originally owned by the royal family and then owned by the state after the execution of Charles the First, mm-hmm. who planted it. Well, um, that's what forest means, isn't it? it, it it's, it's the hunting grounds for royalty. Yeah. So, but in the 1800s, certain areas like Wimbledon Common used yeah. to be common land. Everywhere had a common. Some places still do, and it's rigorously, it, it has to be conti- continually protected from developers. It's one of the reasons why we have a green belt around London, things like that. You know, in certain areas of outstanding natural beauty, those we've, are things we've that got are a common. And it's kind of like been fragmented, and it's not there anymore, really. So well, in the Enclosures Act, ones. which was about 1800 or seventeen ninety eight, some around the turn. It of was the in 18th. the eighteenth, nineteenth century. Yeah. Um, what would happen is landowners would buy all the land around the common. And then give a pittance to every, you know, like a small, sti- not a stipend, like a one-off payment mm. to everybody in the village for the value of the land. So it wasn't there for their descendants or anything like that. And it was a t- tiny, tiny amount of money, the lowest possible valuation of that land. Because before then, if you had nowhere to live, you could put a tent on a common and live there. That's why Scotland's got that right to roam. Um that is now being fragmented by Tories in Scotland as sort of like certain areas where you're not allowed to roam. But essentially, if you're in Scotland, you can pitch a tent wherever you like, mm. as long as you do no damage to the immediate environment where you are, which we mm-hmm. don't have anymore. But Scotland was very um, forward thinking in setting that up. So in Scotland, no, almost all Forestry Commission land is common land, so you are able to wander through it. The only thing you're not allowed to do is fish in most of the lakes and streams and stuff like that because the fishing rights are owned. But as far as camping goes, you're more than welcome to camp wherever you want. Mm. But again, you know, that's just fascism is the manipulation by wealthy people of poor people um, playing on, directly on their fears and then saying, yeah. "I will, I will show you the way if you just submit your will to me." And it, every so often, people get frightened. And they don't get frightened in a way that mobilises them and, and, and drives them towards changing the law in a positive way that fixes it long term. They just, you know, the only you can only get lots and lots of people motivated for a very short length of time. So when you give people a knee jerk option, where yeah. you can say, you know, you can literally pick up a megaphone and say, we can stop the darkies coming here. And they all go, yes, we must stop the darkies coming here because we've got no jobs and stuff like that. They don't for a moment think. You know, hang on, why haven't we got any jobs? What's the history of us not having jobs? Why are we being oppressed? Who is doing the oppressing? It's sort of like, there are new faces. As, you know, people's natural fear of strangers kicks in and they say, right, you've, you've all got to go. And then things let's, will be better. Let's not forget that the three biggest right-wing newspapers in this country... The Sun, have, the Daily Mail and the Telegraph. Uh, well, the, I was thinking more of the Daily Express, but yeah. Um, have been... Um, pushing the 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 oh god what is it the the the, the story I don't know if the story is the right thing they've been pushing the idea mm. that everything that's been wrong there's, 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 there's two culprits two bogeymen to everything that's gone wrong in this country in the last few decades one ah. Europe yeah two immigrants. And probably three, those bloody homosexuals. 
Oh yeah, and that and three those bloody left wing leading yeah. bleeding heart liberals. Yeah. Um, and and when you when you're a, if you're if you're if you're a subscriber to the news, news newspapers and you're reading the same sort of stories day in day out day in day out. These immigrants got these benefits. These immigrants got these benefits. Look at all these jobs that these immigrants are getting in. You can't get a job. Um, look at all these jobs that Europe has meant that you can't get. It's being framed in a way that they that they believe, but it's missing out the important import, the most important parts of it. That it's not the immigrants at all. It's mm. the government that's doing it. It's the and, government fucking with you. And basically, when somebody stands up and says, I can fix it, you know, um, and you have to be a, an out and out liar to say, I can quickly fix this thing that is broken. Yeah. And anybody that's actually going to think about the real issues, when they say, can you fix it? A, 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 you know, a, a decent human being will say, well, I can work towards it but it's going to mm -hmm. take some time whereas a liar and a braggart will stand up and say I can build a fucking wall yeah and if, if only you subsume your will to me and everybody goes well okay then that seems like a very you know I have to do one thing on one day and then everything will be better and it's a lie whereas anybody that oh. says no it's going to be a long hard slog to fix what's wrong with this country they're not interested you mean we'll have to turn up and do things and and work together and maybe suffer a little drop in our standard of living for in order yeah. for it to in the long term be sorted Let, let's let's critically look at what donald trump can do go back to donald trump just to highlight this as how the government's fucking you and again how people lie to get into power mm. donald trump says he's going to build a wall <laughs> he will not build a wall for multiple reasons one america can't afford it two he'll never get anyone in the Senate or the House of Representatives to agree to it in time before the midterms which happen in two years time when the midterms happen the House of Representatives and a third of the Senate are probably going to flop towards Democrat hmm. and he'll lose everything he won't be able to do anything after that no matter how many years he's got left he won't be able to do he'll only have two years left after it but he won't be able to do anything without doing a veto like Obama had to do to get the uh, Affordable Care Act pushed through, um, which is now getting, which is now in the process of getting torn to pieces. Um, and you're right. What will happen when, when, he, when, what will happen when he can't build that wall? Oh, the lefties prevent, prevented us from from building it, hmm. and it'll be a lie that will just reinforce this notion that people who are Ultra conservative, ultra white wing, white nationalists, Nazis, fascists will believe. They'll believe yeah. it because it fits their worldview. And I think this the sad, the saddest, the most saddest thing, when you boil it right down, is that all these people want is hope. Mm. But they are being told day in, day out by liars that there's a quick fix. That that the quick fix is to be a white nationalist yeah, we've and spent a white supremacist. 50 years slowly destroying everything and we, yet we can fix it with one tick on a, you know, on, a, on a box on a piece of paper. We can fix it by kill it, well, getting rid of all the darkies. Yeah. No. They took our jobs. Yeah. Yeah. They took our anyway, jobs. We possibly have to bring this to a close because mm. the discussion alone has been an hour. Okay. So very, very, we very quickly then. On nationalism. <laughs> yeah. Very, very quickly then. Yeah. What can people do to fight against fascism and white supremacists and Nazis? What can we do? In just um, very simple. I think we should have a book of Sammy Smiles for <laughs> nationalists, and then we can uh, pay these money, and then we can send them uh, cards and bits we need and to buy them to see their a certain number of variety yeah. sunshine coaches, oh, and then go on holiday somewhere and, nice. Yeah. And <laughs> Nigel, some Nigel good has, brown has lighted a fiery cross. And, uh, Nigel, Nigel needs to go on holiday to yeah, Barbados. Yeah. Well, I think you were right when you said earlier that we should just we we, we all need to be calling out all. You need to be vigilant constantly. and just say, "I'm sorry, I, I, look, I just don't agree." When somebody mouths off about it, you, just got to not agree, like very loudly, and say, "Look, I don't agree, but for these reasons." And the trick is, it's, mm. it's a bit like when 
um, the Jehovah's Witnesses came to witness to me. And I said, like, I, I, I can't believe in you. I can't believe in your God. And they went, why? I said, well, because if God absolutely knows me because he's omnipotent and omniscient, and they went, yes. I said, he would have sent someone more convincing. Mm. Be more convincing. Be right. And you're not. There's all sorts of evidence to, to basically tell me that you're not right in this belief. So even if it's sexism or homophobia, they're the same things as nationalism yeah. or fascism. Just say, no, and I know, I know different. Whereas you're just spouting out of fear. And, you know, make sure that if you do, you know, if you do cross swords with someone, that you win in front of those people that would otherwise be silent. And then move on about, mm -hmm. you know, don't do it in a kind of like, you know, just absolutely bloody crush someone in front of everybody. Just disagree. Yeah. Because those people are just wanting that person really to shut up. But that per the person that's spouting off all this racist claptrap and all this nationalistic bollocks isn't sure and feels that they're being the hero of the room and everybody secretly agrees with them. So if mm -hmm. one, it's a bit like um, there's that thing where if someone's injured, they can die of their injuries in front of 100 people if everybody waits for someone to step forward. And as yeah. soon as one person steps forward, everything swings into motion. If someone steps forward and looks to the next per the person in front of them and says, call 999, this person's injured. That person will get into action. You know, you look at the next person to them and say, right, get me some air, get me some space around this. And everybody will suddenly wade in. Nobody wants to be the first to move. Yeah, no, nobody wants to be take leadership of it. Yeah, and that's why it works. Because the person that's spouting off is taking that leadership role. Challenge them for it. Yeah. Disagree. Out loud. And that's how it works. That's what power is. It's standing up and being the first person to say a thing. Yeah. Watch it in action. You know, that's how governments work. They're the people saying we should go do this and a whole bunch of people that don't really want to make the decision go, yeah, all right. That's all it is. They don't have, you know, they don't have force of arms over you, particularly. It's just, you know, that one person stands up and say, I'm going to be in fucking charge. Challenge mm -hmm. them for it. Because they're generally full of shit. They're just, they're just chancing it. Like if someone had been run over and somebody st stood up and said, no, let this person die, it's the natural order of things. There's a really good chance people will. Yeah. Because they're the first person to step up and, and say what people should do. Most people don't want to be in charge. And you're not being in charge when you stand up and, and counter it. You're just being in charge of that particular situation at that particular instant in time. Take charge back. Yeah. No, I disagree. You're full of shit. There was a, a bloke talking to a girl in, in our office in the last job and she was going out, you know, for a for a night out. And he said, oh, don't get too drunk. You might get raped on the way home. And it was like, that's some serious fucking victim blaming there. That is totally Are you saying blaming. that you're likely to rape someone if you get too drunk? Try not to rape anybody tonight. Have a good time, but don't rape anyone. <laughs> yeah, try not but to it rape totally changed the mood of the room. It was like, no, I'm not letting you get away with that. That's make, making someone live in fear. You yeah. know, this person isn't doing the bad thing by having a few drinks and, and then being assaulted. The assaulter is the bad person. It's not her fault. It's someone committing a crime against her in an opportunistic way. You should be mm -hmm. able to get absolutely blind drunk, climb into a taxi, pay the 20 quid for throwing up in it and find yourself at home with a police, uh, you know, a traffic cone, a policeman's helmet and an Arthur kebab. That should be everybody's human right to be able to do that unmolested. Yeah, it's not. It's not that person didn't do it to themselves. It's the you know the attackers is the person in the wrong and that should face jail and face prosecution and persecution by everybody they know. And it's the same sort of thing. If you if you victim blame, or you or you you spout off and stuff like that, and or somebody spouting off in a very racist way, unless you counter it, it will, everybody else will just go. I don't want any part of it. But the person doing the countering of it has the power in the room. Take it off them. They don't fucking deserve mm -hmm. it. It's easy enough. It's silent people, you know, are giving that person their power to make that decision for the group. Yeah. Fuck up their day with a smile and a coat. Certainly. Anyway, so we'll wrap this up. This is something we can come back to. Like a lot of our discussions, an hour is just not long enough to discuss it. Yeah. Ever. 
So, but we're going to have to wrap it up, otherwise we'll be, we'll be here all night. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, probably. Right, so uh, that's the discussion. So, Recomedia. So, definitely oh, um, Confederate States of America. Go watch that. And if you haven't started watching it, go watch Utopia. It's fucking mint. Yeah, Utopia's fantastic. Um, Digital Whiskey sent in a few um, shouts to, for things uh, in the in the run. Do you want to go through those? Uh, these are at the bottom. Um, you've got a, a video link to uh, Bruce McArdle's bookcase door. Yeah, that looked pretty cool. That was a completely um, concealed door to a completely concealed room in his house for his man cave, and he built a, a, a hinged powered door which is really interesting out of the bookcase there's a man builds a home in a nu- old nuclear silo mm. and what, uh, it was a decommissioned nuclear silo which meant that they took the lid off and filled it with um, basically uh, rubble and yeah to hollow it out and that's a really there's a whole bunch of those YouTube videos so thanks very much Digital Whiskey for that much appreciated and oh um, Lazy Game Reviews I don't think we put that on last week did we I don't believe we did, no. Oh, I tell you what, that saved me so much money. LGR. Well, it makes me not want to go to thrift stores or, or charity shops to look for computer games <laughs> anymore. Because he's doing all the legwork. <laughs> I'm, I'm, if I had more money, I would Patreon him. Because mm-hmm. it, re- it really does give you your fix of searching for things without having to get out of your house. I watched all 30 yeah. in, under, in under 24 hours. That's brilliant, I could not, I could really not get. I could not look away. And he also does some really mad reviews of really weird tech and strange games and shit. Yeah. And uh, I don't know if you've seen this, Jim Sterling? The Jim Quizzing. Jim Sterling, yes, I've seen Jim Sterling. Yes. Oh, the guy's a, a legend. He is hilarious. And um, he's he's in the middle of a lawsuit. He also taught me how to sort of talk people. He found out how to block uh, monetization of his ads when YouTube award monetization rights if you've infringed copyright. Yeah. But did you see that one? No, I haven't seen that one. It explains the layout of his videos a little bit. He makes sure that he infringes the copyright of at least two mega corporations each episode. Yeah. So the mega corporations go to legal war over who gets the rights to monetize the ad. Because the monetization <laughs> penalty for the company that you've infringed only extends to one advert. Yeah. So if those corporations could share those adverts, those shows would all be monetized by corporations, but they can't. No. So. He deadlocks them in their own selfishness, in effect, which oh, is just stunningly clever and beautiful. And anybody that um, dances around with a giant dildo to uh, Sony copyrighted music is okay in my book. But he does game reviews as well, and he also talks about um, weird legal things that he's been embroiled with. You know, when people when he said he doesn't like something of, of a video game. And those companies yeah. have tried to take him to court over it. He must have. He's got the hardest working lawyer in YouTube. <laughs> so yeah, I thoroughly recommend all those things. He's very good. But Utopia, definitely Utopia. That was amazing, amazing show. <laughs> Clean well. It's a superfood. Superfood. <laughs> <laughs> it's healthy. But yeah. So that's been our show. We'll have we'll easily yeah. clocked in at over two hours again, which is good. We're getting value for money out there in uh, Radio Land. <laughs> On the interwebs. And yes, Rangers TV is still coming. We're still shooting snippets of it. I'm still trying to get shit done badly. It's uh, the progress of small improvements. Yeah. <laughs> So this is, and uh, there'll be some outro music which we've yet to decide on. But I tell you what, the, the, the intellectual property I shall be infringing on this week will probably be the uh, how to what what newspapers what represent who in England from Yes Minute Yes Prime Minister. Oh yeah. <laughs> the way it goes. The Telegraph is for people that own the country. The Guardian is the people is for the people who think they should run the country, and the Sun is the people who think the person who should run the country should have the biggest tits. Yeah. <laughs> so we're, we're going to run with that and some music. But uh, I think we'll go with the future without because they've actually responded to us. From the earlier Rangers thing, we used to have a thing with G7 Welcoming Committee. And uh, unfortunately, they've gone bust. Oh, no. So we need to we need to plug our record companies a bit. So yeah, we'll yeah. Be, we'll be, I think we'll be using indie record companies from here on in. I've got loads of music stockpiled for, for, for a couple of different record companies. 
So German Shepherd Records, um, Shameless Promotion, and A Future Without Records will all mm-hmm. be featuring heavily. And if you have any royalty-free music and you'd like it to appear on the show, get in touch with us at uh, v4v at earthling.net or come in the IRC and have a chat with someone and they'll pass it on to us. Uh, the IRC is irc.freenode.net hash rangers r4nger5 I think that's all we have to say about that. Mm-hmm. So, I've been V. I've been Graffin. I've been A. Hey. <laughs> You've been asleep just asleep. then. Asleep, yes. I also do sleep. I do sleep very well. Yeah. It's because of opposing <laughs> the fascists in the 70s, yes. isn't it? Yeah. It's that hit, that, that smack on the head <laughs> that's with the another, policeman's That's another way of avoiding the, um, the indoctrination. Is yeah, it's just doze when... off halfway through the indoctrination. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't listening. Yeah. Because you were talking shit. Anyway, okay. So, uh, so well, I'll take my sheets. So, take care of uh, of yourselves. Learn how to be, you know, learn more skills. Become more resilient. And uh, may your non-existent God bless you. Yeah. Good night. <laughs> Good night. Good night.
gives us nothing but takes from them everything.